Our sermon passage for today is Romans 8, verses 31 to 39. What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who is raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So today, friends, we're we're coming to the end of our study in Romans 8. And it's a passage of scripture that many have called the most beautiful and most powerful pieces of all scripture. And it's been viewed that way because Romans 8 tackles one of the biggest questions that all of us have a question that all of us are seeking an answer to, and that is the question of assurance. See, it's assurance is that sense that we're seen, that we're accepted, that we're secure, that we're loved, that nothing is ever going to shake us out uh, of, of being accepted. Uh, it's a sense that everything is going to be okay, that, that you're okay, that we're okay, that, that it's all going to work out in the end. And, and what Paul has been arguing for in Romans 8 is that For the Christian, for the person who is following Jesus, we have no greater source, we have no greater resource of assurance than in in Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. See, each and every person in this room this morning is looking for that sense that we're okay, for that sense of assurance. We're looking for it in our career, we're looking for it in a relationship, we're looking for it in uh, our kids, that they turn out okay. We're all looking for assurance in some place. And Paul says there's no better place to go than than to Jesus and what he's done for you. And he's been building up that argument throughout the whole chapter. A few weeks ago when we started Romans 8, we saw that Paul begins his argument by saying that you can know that God is for you. You you can have assurance of his love because because Christ has come and set you free from the law of sin and death, that it's freed you from its demands. And and the things that that we're looking to for assurance, the, the, the things that we're looking to for that sense that we're okay, if it's not Jesus, those things are constantly making demands of you. Your work is making demands that you perform. Uh, your relationships are making demands that, that, you, that, you, can, that you must continue to meet. Uh, our kids are, are, are making demands of our time, and they all condemn us when we fall short. But the words of Jesus begin with, not with do more, but they begin with it is finished. And Jesus says, for those who are in Christ, there is no condemnation for you. You're set free from the demands to perform, to do more. But not only that, in verses 5 to 11, Paul goes on to say that you can be assured of God's love, not just in the intellectual or abstract realm and the idea of uh, you know, freedom or acquittal, but he says you can experience that freedom experientially through the Holy Spirit who lives in you, that, that God himself takes up residence in your heart, and that the, that the God who created the universe and, and who knows every atom, who knows the name of every star in the sky, who knows your every thought in your head, He approves of you so much that he has taken up residence in your heart and he's living in you at this very moment. And not only that, in verses 12 to 17, Paul says the spirit doesn't just live in you. He's at work in you to address and to expel the sin in your life because we so often live in fear that if we mess up in our relationships, if we mess up at work, if we come to a fork in the road and we go left and we should have gone right, we we fear that that our, our system of assurance is going to crumble down around us. But the Spirit's work in us, Paul says, is to weed out in us the, the sin and the fear and the anxiety that we all experience. And so that when we do mess up, the Spirit assures us of God's love by reminding us that we are part of God's family, that, that we're adopted sons and daughters of the King. In verses 19 to 27, Paul continues to pile on this argument of assurance, not just by addressing our sin, but also by addressing our suffering. He knows that Perhaps more than anything, suffering is the thing that keeps us 
uh, that makes us doubt that God sees us or cares us, or cares for us or loves us. And so he takes the time to say that not only does creation groan, and not only do we groan o- over the suffering that we experience, but that God, the Spirit, groans as well. And not as some Im- impotent comforter, but as one who has endured suffering himself in Jesus, so that he can banish all suffering and death forever to wipe away every tear from our eyes that we experience. And last week, as we looked at verses 28 to 30, Paul says that even more, that that we can have confidence in the assurance that's ours in the gospel because we are locked into this golden chain of being foreknown and called and justified and sanctified and eventually glorified by Jesus. That That if we were to fall away from that, God would cease to be God, that his very character is at stake, that if, that if he saved us and couldn't get us to the end, he, he isn't a God that's worthy to be God. He isn't a God that's worth following. We could go to brunch instead. But in fact, we have a God who, who saves and keeps every person who comes to him in faith. And, and finally, as we come to the end of this chapter, Paul has a little bit more to say. And in the passage we just read in verses 31 to 39, he not only summarizes the arguments he's made earlier, uh, but as any good author or speaker does, he anticipates one more final objection to his audience. And let me introduce it by, by way of an example. So ha- have you ever met a couple like this? So just imagine you meet this couple, A and B, and you look at A, and A seems so put together, sophisticated, uh, you know, the life of the party, and, and, and B is you know, a little off-putting, a little eccentric, and, and then you start to wonder, how in the world is A together with B? Like, what keeps them together? What does A, C, and B, how, how, do, they, how do they work? How does it, you know, how, how, do they, how do they stay together? And then as you get to know A and B, you find that A has like a ton of insecurities, and A is so anxious and worried, and, and, and actually looks to B as the person who keeps them sane and grounded. And, and, and then, you know, you start to ask the question in reverse, like, what in the world does B, C, and A, like, how do they stick together? You know, why, how does B uh, hang out with A if they're such a nervous wreck all the time? Uh, it's that kind of relationship that, that often looks like the Christian life. Uh, you know, the, the, the first question we ask, why does A stick with B, is often a question that a Christian asks early on in the relationship with God, that, that as they're considering faith and they look at the high cost uh, of entering into a relationship with God, the high social cost, um, the cost of, of time, the cost of uh, just admitting your faults, admitting that, that you're not perfect, that you don't have it together, uh, the cost of belonging to a new family, the, the, the church community, you wonder uh, at the beginning, is it worth it? Um, it is, is God worth it? Will I, will I stick it out with him? And then as you start following Jesus, over a certain period of time, you start to ask the other question. You're, you, don't, you, don't, you don't ask, do I want to stick it out with God? You ask, how in the world is God sticking it out with me? Uh, what, what in the world does God see in me as somebody who has so many foibles and flaws and missteps and mistakes? What does God see in me that, that he's so committed to me? Why doesn't he just wash his hands and walk away and, and, and do something better with his time? You see, this is the kind of, of question that, that Paul is addressing at the end of Romans 8. And when doubts like this begin to, to creep into our mind, these final nine verses of Romans 8, Paul asks a series of unanswerable questions that are meant to excavate those doubts that we have. And they're unanswerable um, that in the sense that, that we're not, that, not that we're not meant to give an answer to them. Like these, these questions that Paul asks aren't like rhetorical questions that are meant to you know, get our minds thinking. These are unanswerable questions in the sense that we literally can't give an answer to them. The way that Paul frames and, and even answers some of these questions right after asking them tells us that, that there's ways that we cannot answer these questions in our mind. And so in our time together, I want, us to look at, I want us to look at five unanswerable questions and then conclude where Paul concludes with an unshakable love. So unanswerable questions and then unshakable love. So if you are looking to underline what these five questions are, they come to us one after another in verses 31 to 35. Uh, the first unanswerable question comes to us in verse 31. It says, if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? This question speaks to the doubt that arises from our circumstances. Uh, that what I'm facing right now is too hard, uh, that it's too much, that, that, that I'm overwhelmed. Um, our circumstances and situations are, are often so all-consuming that we focus on that, that, that um, second half of the question, like who can be against us? Like in our day-to-day, day-to-day lives, we recognize 
there's a lot against us, right? Our circumstances are against us. Our suffering is against us. Our sin is against us. You, you know, the devil is against us. And grace of all, even death stands against us. And what is it for you? Like, what circumstance unfolding in your life right now is causing you to doubt that God is for you? Could it be the loss of a job? Could it be financial strain, uncertainty about the future? And, and notice what Paul is doing here. He's not trying to shame you but, or, or tell you to not focus on your circumstances. What Paul is doing right now is he's trying to bring God back into our field of vision. Because so often we, we get tunnel vision about our circumstances that we lose sight, that, that God is present, that he's near. And so Paul is bringing God back into our, our line of sight to, to let us know that, that this question is unanswerable, that, that while our circumstances are great, that if God is in the picture, there's nothing, not, no, no circumstance, no situation that can stand, uh, that can overcome or overwhelm you. He's saying that if God is for you, and this word if in the Greek can also be translated since, that since God is for you, what could possibly come against you? Your circumstances can and will certainly overwhelm you in your own strength, in your own power, but they are not too much for God. And and one pastor in Chicago, a guy named uh, by the name of Charlie Bates, uh, he often tells young believers that the Christian life is learning, to, is learning how to win with God. He says you have to learn how to win with God because you're never going to win without him. You either have to learn to, to win with God or you're never going to win without him. Uh, or, or to put it into a Presbyterian register, uh, the late Tim Keller used to say that uh, before you become a Christian, you're, fi- you're, you're, you're engaged in a battle that you cannot win. But after you follow Jesus, you start fighting a battle you cannot lose. You go from fighting a battle you cannot win to fighting a battle you cannot lose. And so, are your circumstances this morning making you doubt God's assurance? And what might it look like this week to bring God back into your field of vision to remember that he is near, that he is with you? So that first unanswerable question addresses the doubt from our circumstances. The second question responds to the doubt that often arises from God's intentions or purposes for us. That it's not our circumstances, but it's God's intentions. It's the doubt that says, I'm not actually sure that God wants good things for me. I'm not actually sure that, that God is uh, looking after my best interests. I feel like he's a God who's continually demanding more from me, who demands a performance and just blind obedience. We see God as a taskmaster, as perpetually dissatisfied, um, or as a boss who makes relentless demands on his employees. And, and maybe you felt that way. It may be your view of God uh, is like this. And this is the kind of view of God that's keeping you from trusting him, that, that he's a God who just demands more and more and more. And to that, can I say that that view of God is not the God uh, of, of the scripture? That, that might be a God of your imagination. But that's not the God of the Bible. And if the God that you believe in is just some divine taskmaster that you don't want to believe in, well, can I just say that that's not the kind of God I want to believe in either? That's not the kind of God that I believe in either. And look at Paul's second question in verse 32. He he says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Paul's saying that God's first impulse toward us is not uh, to demand things from us, but to give things to us. God's first first instinct toward us is not not to take, but to give. You see, God... Uh, is not just some divine taskmaster. He is a good father who gives gifts to his children. And if you doubt God's intentions for you, if you doubt that God truly has your good in mind, he's imploring you to look to Jesus. You see, Paul is making an argument from the greater to the lesser. He says, if God has not held back his own son, his most prized possession, his most treasured asset, if God has not held back even that from you, how will you not also with Jesus give you all things and more? How will I not give you uh, Jesus plus everything else? You see, friends, what might it look like to have your heart continually reoriented around that truth? That, that if God did not spare even his own son but gave him up for us all, that, that we can be confident that, of course, God's intentions for us are good, even if we can't make sense of our circumstances in the moment. That the cross is a reminder of the continuing, unfailing generosity of God. The third question in in verse 33 responds to the doubt uh, that we often experience uh, of our guilt or what we've done. 
It's the doubt that says, you know that suffering that I'm experiencing right now? It's probably because I deserve it. It's probably because I've done something wrong um, and and this is the punishment for those actions. And to that line of doubt, Paul's response in, in verse 33 is this. Who will bring any charge against God's elect? Who will bring any accusation against the people that God has chosen? You see, catch what Paul is saying here. He, he's not saying, no, of course not. You've never done anything wrong. Like, you're amazing. You're, you're such, you know, everybody loves you. Everybody likes you. You're a good person. Uh, Paul, Paul isn't minimizing or ignoring or downplaying the, the sin or the bad things that we've done. Rather, he's saying, you have done things that deserve judgment. Th- things that do need to be made right. Uh, but Jesus has done that for you. And the scripture is honest about our sin But scripture is also honest about God's justice and his mercy and what he's done to address it. And as Romans 8 has shown that God has saved us, not because there's anything lovely in us, but God has saved us because he has loved us unconditionally and from all eternity. You see, friends, maybe you need to hear this, that that God, he he truly, really loves you. He loves the idea of you. He, he, He thought of you to begin with. God is uh, over the top in love with you. He thought you up. He knows what you've done from all eternity, and even still, he looked upon you, and he has chosen you. He said, that one, she's mine. He, he is my adopted son. And Paul says that if God, who knows everything about you, has chosen you, then there's no accusation that can come against you that will, that will stand there, there are no charges against you that will stick because he knows everything about you and he has loved you anyway. And because uh, of what Jesus has done for you, paying for your sin, paying the debt that you and I owe for our rebellion against God and for the ways that we have broken the world and harmed one another, because Jesus has paid for that in full, God in his justice is not going to accept two debts for one payment. Because Jesus has paid it all, all to him we owe. There, there's nothing else that that can be done. And so, friends, if, if you see Jesus as your advocate, ha, uh, you can know, you can see uh, God's love and assurance in your life. But you see the fourth doubt. Uh, we talked about how, uh, if who can bring any charge against God's elect dealing with our guilt. This fourth question that he asks in verse 34 uh, addresses uh, maybe the, the other side of that coin, not just our guilt, but our shame. See, guilt tells you, said, guilt tells you I, I've done a bad thing. And shame says, I am a bad person. Not just that I do bad things, but I am a, a bad person. Uh, this, this is a doubt that, that consumes our identity and our sense of self-worth. And, and you, you hear Paul's question in verse 34. He says, who is to condemn? Who is to condemn? And, and if that question stood by itself, if, if it didn't follow with the, the answer immediately after he asked the question, uh, we could say, yeah, there, there's a lot that can, that can condemn us. Um, the, the, the world can condemn us. Um, our, our sin can condemn us. Our own hearts from time to time can condemn us. But just as soon as Paul asks that question, he gives an answer that makes this question unanswerable, that, that no one can challenge. He says, if Christ died for your sin, and, and if he was raised for your justification, and if he has ascended into heaven and right now sits at the, at the hand of God the Father, and if he is interceding for you at this very moment, praying on your behalf to God the Father, that your name right now is on his lips as he has a conversation with his Father, how could you ever be condemned? How could you ever feel like you're unworthy or not enough? It, it's like the story in John's Gospel where the crowds bring a, a woman to him who is caught in adultery, and they want Jesus to condemn her to death. But what does Jesus do? He looks at her, he loves her, and says, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. And as they walk away one by one, so that it's only Jesus and this woman remaining, Jesus looks around and says, woman, where are your accusers? And she says, nowhere, Lord. And Jesus says in response, neither do I condemn you. Now go and leave your life of sin. And notice the gospel order in that logic. Jesus says, don't first get your act together and then you won't be condemned. He says, no, there is no condemnation for you. Now go and sin no more. 
Jesus doesn't minimize her sin. He doesn't exempt her out of of the life of holiness and obedience to God. Uh, But neither does he condemn her. Why? Because Jesus, in his ministry, in his life, his death, his resurrection and ascension, came to bear the condemnation that she deserved. Came to bear the judgment that, that you and I deserve in our place so that we could be set free. So that when, when the accusations come, when the condemnation is, is being shouted out for that we might experience it, Jesus says there is no one to condemn because Jesus is, has died, has risen again, has ascended, and is currently interceding, having a, having a wonderful conversation to God on your behalf at this very moment. So friends, if you're here and you're being crushed under the weight of shame that, that you're not enough, look at Jesus and, 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 and see that all he has endured for you and, and know that because of what Jesus went through for you, how could you ever feel less than? How could you ever feel unforgiven? And, and then the fifth and last unanswerable question comes to us in verse 35. Uh, and this question is perhaps the greatest doubt of them all, uh, the doubt that, that God has abandoned us, that, that we're cut off, that we're alone. Paul asks, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he starts looking around for an answer. He he says, can circumstances separate us? Tribulation, distress, persecution. Can our material needs separate us? Famine, nakedness. Can death separate us? Danger or sword. Can any of these cut us off from the love of God? And Paul's answer is is an unequivocal and resounding no. No, nothing can shake us from, from, from Christ. Why? Because of his unshakable love. Paul's answer to the question of our separation from God is a resounding no because of the unshakable love of God. Paul says, can anything inside of you, guilt or shame, can anything outside of you, your circumstances, your suffering or death, thwart God's love for you or his ability to save? Absolutely not. And in verses 38 and 39, Paul rattles off 10 more things that that could try to separate us from the love of God. He says there's nothing in life or death, nothing from the spiritual realm, angels or demons, nothing in time or space, right? No no, no height nor depth, nor things present or things to come, no power or, or just for the kitchen sink, if there's anything that he missed, nor anything else in all creation that could separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And the language that Paul uses at the start of this list in verse 38, when he says, I am sure of this, you could translate it as, as I am convinced. In the Greek, it's in this interesting tense called the perfect tense, which, which, which he says, I, I, I am convinced of this, and I will forever continue to be convinced of this. Paul is saying that, that he's logicked it out. He, he's done the math. He has thought this through. And, and so often, Christianity can be, can be portrayed and, and thought of as this, this emotive, emotional uh, thing that, that it's a crutch for, for the insecure, for the people who have, um, who have emotional needs, who, who need support from, from the outside. Paul is saying in this sense, by, by saying, I am convinced, I am sure of this, that Christianity is a thinking religion. That, that so often our, our doubts, our insecurities come not, not from not thinking about the faith and just you know, taking things on blind faith. Paul says a lot of our problems in following Jesus come because we're not thinking enough. Uh, it's interesting in the book of Acts when Paul is on trial before this king called Agrippa, that the, when, when he's explained the Christian faith to him, uh, Agrippa's response to Paul is not, Paul, you're just being emotional, right? You're, 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 you're overreacting. You need to turn, turn the knob down a little bit. Agrippa's reaction to Paul is, Paul, your great learning has driven you mad. Paul, you, you're, you're, you're talking like someone who's been overeducated in this subject. But Paul is saying, no, Agrippa, it, I've done the work. I, I have researched the material. I am convinced that there is nothing in all creation, the entire cosmos, that can separate us from Christ Jesus, our Lord. And, and friends, maybe your, your problems with assurance today isn't, isn't because it, there's an emotional gap. Maybe, maybe there is an intellectual gap. Have you, have you thought it through? Have you done the math? Ha, have you reckoned yourself that Jesus, that, that there is nothing in him that can separate you from the love of God? That Paul says, when, when, when you think about what Christ has done for you, and then you ask yourself that if Jesus, Jesus is the only one who deserves the unshakable love of the Father, the, the only one who has done uh, everything well, everything perfectly, the, the only one who, who, would, who would be welcomed and embraced by the Father, that if he was cut off for you, that if on the cross he experienced 
the, the separation from God that you and I deserve, that on the cross he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That if he was cast out so that you and I could be welcomed into the presence of God and never asked to leave it, that if this God did all that for you, then friends, why would we ever doubt that God doesn't want anything to do with us? Friends, he loves you. He, he sent his son and cast him out so that we could be brought in to his presence and never asked to leave it. That, that if we really grasped and meditated on that truth and became convinced of it in our own minds, we would say what Paul says here, that, that we're not simply victims or survivors or even conquerors, but Paul would say that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Friends, there's nothing that can separate you from God's love because at the end of the day, you're not saved by the amount of faith that you possess or by the strength of faith that you exert in trying to follow Jesus you're saved by the object of your faith. You're saved not, not so much by your grip on Christ, but Christ's grip on you. And friends, if he is holding on to you this morning, he's never going to let you go. Nothing is going to snatch you out of his hands. You see, friends, you're not strong enough to shake yourself out of, out of God's redeeming, redeeming love for you. Friends, Paul's questions aren't arbitrary. Um, they're all about the kind of God that we believe in. Together they affirm that absolutely nothing can frustrate God's purpose since he's for us, that, or, or quench his generosity since he hasn't spared even his only son, or, or can accuse and condemn his, his chosen people for he alone is justified and sanctified and will eventually glorify us in Christ or separate us from his love since he has revealed it all to us in Jesus. And as we said, there are a hundred reasons for us to lack assurance this morning. But there is only one antidote. There is a balm in Gilead. There is a panacea. And his name is Jesus. And friends, won't you come to him today? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who loves us with an unshakable, uh, eternal, undying love. Lord, that you have committed yourselves to us and that you are not going to let us go. Help us to really believe that this week. Help us to take this gospel truth and to apply it to our anxieties, apply it to our circumstances, apply it to our sufferings, uh, apply it to the parts of our heart and soul that really need to believe this truth. For, for those friends of ours in our congregation who are uh, taking a step out into, of Madison into their next chapter, who are full of uncertainty and worry, who are anxious about the next step. Lord, would this truth become especially real to them now that, that there is no height nor depth nor, nor city nor place nor, uh, nor uh, anything in all creation that can separate them from your love. God, help us to, to really believe this is true. And when we struggle, would this table even be another reminder your unending eternal love for us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.